Hi, my name is Chris Hillary. I work for Oracle. Uh, I work on the Zorba X Query processor, which is going to show up a little bit later. So, go ahead and get started. What I'm going to talk about today, so I'm going to tell you the who, what, where, when, how, and why of JSONic. What I'm not going to be showing you, even though the talk is titled Implementing JSONic, I'm not going to be showing you code. It's not that level of, of uh, detail we're going to be going into. But before I get started, I'm going to have a quick survey. So, who's here? First of all, who was here at Jonathan's talk just in this previous room? <coughs> Most of you, okay. So this is gonna, some of this is definitely gonna be a little bit of review. I'm gonna have a slightly different focus and we'll go into a little bit more detail about some of the things that he talked about. Who uses XML? Most of you, awesome. Who uses JSON? Also most of you, awesome. Who uses XQuery? <laughs> a lot of you. <laughs> That's good, all right. Who works on the implementation of an XQuery engine? Yeah, yeah I know, I know. Is anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> Got anybody from uh, MarkLogic here? Maybe? Okay, so who works on the implementation of some other kind of query engine? No SQL database, some kind of couple. So you guys are definitely the main focus. My, 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 my audience today is to the implementers. What we'd really love is to see JSON added to other XQuery engines and especially to NoSQL databases. But I'll give another taste of JSONic, so I'll encourage all of you to, who use JSON to download Zorb and give it a try. So, <coughs> real quick overview, and again, this is going to be a refresher, so I'll go as fast as I can. JSONic, it's a query language for JSON data. Not too surprising there. It supports everything that a fully featured query language should, and then some. It's got a lot of features. We're going to demonstrate a few of those as we go. And it was defined by, as an extension to XQuery 3.0. It's also defined by several of the same people who wrote 3.0. So why would you do that? Why would you start from XQuery? Well, XQuery has a long history. It's over a decade of design and development put into it. Some of the brightest minds in the data and the query worlds have contributed to it to make it what it is today. It's robust, it's flexible, has, has power for query joins, transformations, it's got extensions for updates, scripting, full text queries. There's also a lot of implementations out there already. Over 60 commercial and open source implementations are, are known to exist in many languages, many different environments. So, and it turns out, designing a good query language is actually pretty hard to do, so why reinvent the wheel? So I'll flip over to my first little demo to show you a little bit about what we can do. This is actually gonna be kinda hard. <laughs> I got a mouse here, and... So this is live data here. What we've just done here is I hit Twitter and I asked for the last 100 tweets that contain the word NoSQL now. This may look familiar if any of you happen to have seen uh, Matthias' talk about 20 at MSAC earlier this morning. Um, and I've done a lot of filtering here. I get back the results of that, of that extent and then I get the text from each one of them. I go through tokenizing into strings using full text querying. I then I eliminate all words that are stop words, the, and all that kind of thing that we're not as interested in. I put them in lowercase, I strip the diacritics so that if somebody happened to have tweeted in Spanish or had a, a different <coughs> accent, we don't care so much about that. I group them all by those words, get a count, order them by that count, and here, the result, is a list of all the words that people who have tweeted about NoSQL now have also tweeted about. So this gives us some interesting information. You know, apparently William McKnight is apparently popular among tweeters that are among, all right here, MongoDB Keynote, JSONic, hey, look at that. So, um, <laughs> A lot of good information here. In fact, kind of too much information in there. So what happens if I do this? So I just said, OK, I only want to see the things that are actually more than nine. So I just limited it right down. So you might see also here that I have taken JSON input and I've produced XML as output. But I don't have to do that. I could just as easily have a slight variation on this same query that instead produces a single output, which is all of the all of that same information as a JSON object, where I just put the key is the the word that was a question, and the value is how many times it was tweeted about. Now you can see I've taken out the order by clause because JSON objects aren't ordered, so there's no need for that. So this demo was run on Zorba, which is an open source XQuery engine. So let's talk a little bit about what Zorba is. Open source, cross-platform XQuery engine. There's the URL. Please feel free to download it, give it a try. 
has developed by the Flower Foundation with support from Oracle, and the person myself, and some others, as well as 28 Entech. And implements the full catastrophe, as my boss would put it, of the XML, XML and XQuery specifications. Query and update full text scripting. There's also a ton of additional modules for all sorts of different things. You saw we already were using the HTTP module to download things from the web there. And this is the validation of JSONic. We added JSON support to XQuery in about a month. And this is a team of three, maybe four people working on it. So the takeaway, if there is one from here, is that given XQuery, JSONic is not that hard. So why should you care about JSONic? Well, if you use JSON, not too surprisingly, it's ready to use today. You can do some good querying. It's not bound to any particular vendor. If you use XQuery, though, then now you have access to a whole new world of JSON data. And again, the people who really want to address people who are implementing a JSON-based NoSQL engine give your users more control. So let's begin. I'm going to go into some of the detail about how it is implemented. And I, I don't expect people to read this slide as is, unless you really, really love language grammars. But the takeaway here is the great bit in bright, bright green over there, which is that this is really not that hard. We've had four productions here, and that added direct constructors. What are direct constructors? Well, here's an example. Oops. So this is a query, that's the result. The query looks a lot like JSON, and it produces something that is, in fact, JSON. So this is, it looks almost exactly like JSON. If you're familiar with XQuery, you know that you can also throw XML element constructors, which look a lot like XML, right in the middle of your query, and do things with them. But the more interesting stuff comes when it's not literal. Because everything, every value in there, can in fact be an expression. So there's a very simple XQuery expression, 1, 2, 10, which says, give me the values from 1 to 10, throw it into an array. So this is the composability of JSONic. It says that anywhere you can have a value, you can have an expression, build up your query from that. And just to complete the, the list, that's how you construct an object. Um, so this is actually just a refresher of the stuff I just showed. But if you don't have literals, you have composability. All right, so we see the syntax for defining uh, for constructing an item, but of course the set of data that XQuery was designed to query is XML, not JSON. So the XQuery has a data model which is defined by XML. So JSONic, we extended the data model with two new JSON types, which are called structured items. Now in XQuery, you define non-atomic types in terms of properties and accessors. The properties for an object is just a simple set of key value pairs, and the accessors are all you might expect. Give me a list of keys, give me the value for a key, Array is an ordered list of members, which are also all items. And the max there are a size and a value for a particular key. So the takeaway here, again, the bright green, is that this is easy. This is, I mean, these are very simple <coughs> concepts. They're much simpler than many of the concepts that are already there in XQuery. Um, an XML element is probably the closest thing to a JSON object, and it's got a huge amount more baggage associated with it. Don't need to worry about any of that. Uh, an array is something like what is called a sequence in XQuery, and uh, an array is much more straightforward. This is straightforward and easy to implement. Uh, this slide is a little off the beaten path, so feel free to fade out for a second, but I thought I'd mention it. Um, one of the cool things about JSONic is that now you have JSON objects and values in your query language. And Having access to those structured items is actually very valuable. Their XML doesn't have any corollary to a map or an array. And these are obviously things that are commonly used in almost any programming constructs. So JSON arrays and objects fill that void. They're more programmer friendly. And if you fall back to using XML to that, you're actually making the query processor work a lot harder. One of the reasons for that is that, J one of the reasons it is much easier to work with JSON item is that they don't expose their identity. What does that mean? It means the compiler has the right to reuse those objects. It can, doesn't have to worry about the ordering of them. And it's just easier to implement. So this, uh, this actually is as telling you that it's valuable to have these things, even if your use case doesn't necessarily focus on JSON. This opens up a lot of interesting programming options, even for straight XML and XQuery. Um, as a side note, JSON items do have an identity. It's just that they're only used in the context of an update, which we'll talk about a little bit. <coughs> so the JSON data model 
is a very simple one, which most of you I'm sure are very familiar with. You've got objects and arrays, and then you've got a few atomic simple types. You've got numerics, so you've got true, false, you've got null. Now XQuery already supports most of these types out of the box. So JSONic simply reuses them, which means there's no implementation at all. So for strings, we use XS string. For true and false, we use XS boolean. For numerics, we use either integer, double, or decimal, depending on the exact form of the number involved. The only thing we needed to add is that one over there, J and null, which is one more thing you've got to add to your type system. That is the simplest possible type you can imagine because it has exactly one value, null. So it's a singleton. You don't really have to do much of that. Um, brief aside, all of these other types are now available to you if you're working in JSONic with the full capacity of XML. The JSONic doesn't limit the things that can be stored in an object or an array to be the things that are in the JSON data model. You can feel free to throw in date times, do things like compute dates, compute date deltas and all that. There's functions already built into XQuery to do that for you. Uh, full disclosure, the serialization of those things is not entirely determined yet, which is why I don't have a demo showing exactly how that works, but internally it works just great. And the other thing I want to take away from this is that I've just covered the entirety of the JSONic data model in two slides. So, we've seen how we declare JSON data using direct constructors. We've seen how the JSONic engine stores that data in the data model. Now, how do we get the values back in our query? Now, this here is the only semantic extension that JSONic really applies to the language. So, in XQuery 3.0, we have a concept of function items where an item may be a function, <coughs> item represented by this variable, for example, $L, may be a function, and you call it using the syntax by throwing parentheses after it, basically like a function pointer in C. So that syntax isn't defined for any other items, so we reused it for objects and arrays. So let me show you kind of a wacky, but kind of entertaining example of that, just to keep things interesting. Where's my cursor? There it is. So it's another variation of the Twitter query but I've done something a little bit different with it. <clears throat> so here, I filtered out all the tweets that have geotagging. <coughs> and I've gotten the coordinates of that, and I've thrown those coordinates off to Google Maps. And I asked it, where's the nearest Chinese restaurant to the person who just did that tweet? And then I construct a new item. Well, I'm sorry, I'm doing that. I, just, I compose those bits and pieces. This is using the accessor uh, syntax that we just talked about. Got the first and then the second coordinates, sent it off to Google Maps. And then I create a new object down here where I'm using one result using the accessor from the original Twitter result and then two bits of the result I got from Google Maps. And here it is. So it looks like Mr. Uh, T. Howard 37 here has been tweeting a little bit with his, geo, with his uh, GPS on. And it looks like he's actually moving at the time because the closest Chinese <laughs> restaurant has, uh, has changed during that time. So. So, now the specification, only the JSONic specification, defines the semantics of this strictly in terms of dynamics. So, in terms of dynamic invocation, which is the behavior is determined runtime. However, Zorga, we actually have static type checking. It's an optimization we can provide, which means that we can determine statically, or if we can determine statically, that a particular variable is an object or an array, then we can create the query execution plan that says, go ahead and get those objects out right away. All right, um, actually moving faster than I expected, so I'll slow down a little bit. Um, so briefly here, XQuery has the ability to update, so, so does JSON. So this is, means that you can not only query data and do things with it and create new data, but you can also manipulate and modify that data in place. And this is particularly good when you're interacting with a REST API, because you can get an object, you can manipulate it, and then you can put it right back to the same API. And I have a small demo of this as well. And this is an issue <laughs> that is near and dear to my heart, which is our bug database on Launchpad. So Launchpad has a bit of an annoyance where we can mark things for a particular milestone and mark them committed, but then when we actually mark that milestone as shipped, it doesn't change all those bugs and say that they're released. So I've written a very small query here, which does that for me here. Um, hitting the, the REST API, I believe it's a REST API, it's a JSON-based API from Launchpad to get all the bugs that have our most recent milestone, 2.6, which we shipped a week or two ago, that were marked fixed committed. 
and I iterate through all of them, and I say replace the date of fixed release with the current date time. I don't even have to, I mean, I can run this query again when we do 2.7, and again when we do 3.0, because I don't have to modify the date, it's using the stuff right out of XQuery. I replace the status of fixed release, and here are the results. So you can see the fixed release now is there, it uses QTC, status is now fixed release. Um, now, I didn't actually finish this demo such that it actually then took all those bugs and posted them back to Launchpad. Um, because that would involve some authorization issues. But we can do that. Launchpad is based on OAuth. Zorba has an OAuth module. This would totally work. So as my green friend down here at the tells you, the implementation here is, is pretty straightforward. Um, because again, the data structures we're talking about here are pretty simple. There's, you know, the kind of things you have to do are insert into an array or delete from an array, rename a value in an object. Not particularly complicated stuff. So, wrapping up, here's the things that we've actually talked about, the yellow stuff. All these other things in white are mostly corollaries to the kind of stuff we already talked about. The update primitives, the actual implementation of the update statements, the item type grammar productions are ways to identify and use the uh, data model types, several of the built-in functions, are for calling the accessors on the data model. Uh, a lot of them, other ones, are for handling input and output. So we have uh, the ability to parse JSON, which we saw in several of the demo queries. Um, also a serialization to then produce the results. And the corners. Error codes, one new option, a few little things like that. But the takeaway here is that that's it. If you're starting from XQuery 3.0 at the very least, here's one slide that tells you everything you need to do to have fully functioning JSON to your processor. So something that's definitely gonna be of interest to everybody here, mostly, I guess, is that, okay, that's great, but I'm using Mongo, or I'm using Couch. That's where my data is. Yes, it's in JSON, and I like to do things with it, but they're not running Zorba yet. So what can I do? Well, today, you can download and use Zorba as it is, as an external tool, as an external programming language, as part of your toolkit for solving your application problems. It's pretty much the same as you would use Python, or Ruby, or even, even JavaScript today to connect to your database, get information, process it, and return it to your application. The difference is that you're doing it now in a language which is designed from the ground up for JSON manipulation, for manipulating structured data and working with it. Uh, in particular, if you're using CouchDB, you can get stuff used in the REST interface and manipulate it and put it right back pretty trivially. Uh, soon, I have been promised soon that there will be a Visa module as part of the open source Zorba download, which means now you'll be able to actually get the stuff directly from Mongo in its binary form and interact with it in that form. And we can really put it back to Mongo as well. Also from the third party, I'm TS. Um, uh, they, there's an extended version of Zorga, Zorba with Mongo integration, which includes query pushdown, which means that they can do things like you can have your X complicated query, and any bit of it that it knows that it can actually ask Mongo about, it'll do. It'll pass that information to Mongo, take it back, and then complete the rest of the query locally. But what, again, we'd really like to see, and the ideal, is we'd love to have integration from the database vendors themselves. This is something we really want to work for, and we really like to encourage you to download and play with Zorba and decide that you like it and help us encourage them to do that kind of thing. And Zorba is an open source project. We'd love for them to start with it. So that's actually all I have, so please. What, what kind of integration are you hoping for from the demo? Well, most of them have some form of what you might call a query language. Um, or at least some way to get the data out of their system. The problem is that every single one of them has their own version of that, be it a functional language or a template-based thing from Mongo or something like that. What we'd really love is for each of them to be able to have a JSONic processor as part of their, at least as part of their client side, that is capable of mo the most efficient interaction with their back end. Something like what, what uh, should have said, 20 m like has done with, um, with uh, MongoDB. It would be very nice if that kind of thing could be handled, and it would be very nice if it could be handled consistently across vendors as well, because it would make it much easier for people to try out different NoSQL vendors for, and see which one works best for their, their problem. 
That's your password. So how is that SOBA uh, mechanism integrated into a database? And, and how well does it uh, work with multi-threaded application? <laughs> Uh, Zorba and multi-threading, unfortunately, don't get along terribly well right now. Um, it's, I mean, Zorba itself is not integrated with a database at all. It's a, it's a standalone query processor. Mm -hmm. um, I actually can't speak too much to the, the low-level Mongo integration. I know it exists, but it was done by a company other than myself. Um, the guy who did it is right there, so feel free to talk to him. <laughs> yeah. um. So the database has a uh, Oracle database, particularly has a capacity to extract the data and convert into XML tag, right? Mm -hmm. So they have the engine. So do they? I mean, do you uh, think that the, uh, they have they can incorporate this kind of uh, algorithm or into the engine into the database and uh, produce a JSON output? Um, I would certainly hope that they could. Um, I suspect there may be some legal issues about them integrating an open source project directly, but the specification is free for them to use. Um, I think probably a better fit would be uh, or about Oracle's XMLDB product um, or the uh, NoSQL database that they have a booth about out there that they're starting to discuss. Um, and yeah, we, we, would, we would love to work with them. How about the daytime JSON doesn't have native date time, mm -hmm. and so how do you translate between the two? Because the language, I'm assuming you want the XQuery side, you know, the date time type. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. How, do you have any plans? Well, uh, there's not only a plan, but half of an implementation. Um, serialization of JSONic right now says basically when you're serializing a JSON object or array, if you come across anything that isn't JSON, then there's a, a sort of, it, it creates an object on the fly which says this is not JSON, but it's, it has this type and this value, serialized or whatever. Um, just so the obvious corollary of that would be that we need to have a parser that can recognize that and parse it back in and create the data model as it is. And that's actually something we're hoping to implement pretty soon. This, that serialization side is already there. If I can speak to the date time thing, um, databases go ahead and add that sort of thing to it. And the thing is that they all do it a little bit differently. And this is just another symptom of the JSON, uh, of the NoSQL vendors not acting like the community and not offering a platform to the users. This is exactly the sort of thing that users should be asking for them to do in the same way. And if they could, prevent, if they could produce that output in a fashion that looks like uh, the way XML schema says to represent date times, then we'd be able to read it and use it and produce it the way we want. This actually uh, <clears throat> looks like an interesting area of crossover between what you're doing here with JSONIC and uh, JSONLD, which allows you to define a context where you can specify the data types associated with the properties of the JSON. Hmm. So for instance, uh, date time, date, duration, and all of that stuff to be defined in another document which then could presumably help your query optimizer to, uh, to, to have advanced knowledge to expect that these particular fields are going to be in a date time. Right. That's uh, certainly the case that um, when you're dealing with XML documents defined by a schema, that Zorba is capable of using that schema information for optimization purposes. So yeah, if there is anything like a schema language for JSON, be it JSON LD or something else, then yeah, I would imagine that would be a fairly easy optimization to add. There's also a JSON schema effort out there sometimes. Now, I, I'd be very curious to see how those, how those progress and whether they have any take up, um, because a lot of people, I mean, I, I've seen at least some hypothesizing that the day that somebody comes up with JSON schema will be the day that JSON dies. Um, it's, it will happen. I, I feel confident it will happen. At the very least, databases probably can do a lot of good things if they can define at least a minimum of what needs to be there for something. And you can already do that with Mongo and a few others today by specifying indexes, and they can reject things that go in that don't have the correct index fields and so forth. And that's the first step in that direction, at least. And then there's the bad word of namespaces. Yes. One of the things that. Uh, that uh, we specifically didn't want to have in the JSON data model. <laughs> but it was there for a reason. I mean, it did, it did solve a problem, so perhaps someday it'll rewrite that again. Question?
Uh, the bad word, namespaces. <laughs> Whether somebody would want to add namespaces in JSON, the answer is probably somebody will have a problem eventually that will be solved by that, but whether that it will be enough to actually have cause it to happen, I, I kind of think not. So Chris, you must have uh, thought about that. I'm just thinking, if you have the JSON uh, data mm -hmm. in your database, um, you talked about the XQuery and the uh, JSON, JSON uh, uh, presentation of query. So I'm just thinking how you can have a layer built. So you can then uh, on top put a SQL query layer. Mm -hmm. So it can kind of convert into a query and, and do the searches and all that. So how do you envision this kind of a layer uh, which can work on top of your SQL? The problem is, and I don't know if you're here for Jonathan's talk, but he went into some more detail about this. But the, the problem is that the SQL data model doesn't map very well to non-structured or semi-structured data. And so, I mean, as much as SQL has a tremendous amount of history and a tremendous amount of tooling available for it, it can't really do everything you need to do if your data is in JSON or XML. So any layer like that, at the very least, would by necessity be somewhat crippled or at least limited in what it could do. That's not to say it's not useful, um, but and, and I, mean, you could, I, I could envision a trivial implementation pretty easy. I mean, I mean uh, a SQL parser is not particularly complicated to write, and all it would have to do is say, OK, I'm asking for these particular things that I know those are the names of, and as long as they map to the object ID keys in your Mongo database, for example, pull those objects and then put them into your query. Um, I, I would. Be, I'd be, I don't think it would be hard to do. I would be a little bit surprised yeah. if it really was a good solution to very many problems. So uh, does that mean that you envision some kind of X queries coming into the SQL or whatever way you query mm -hmm. your data? I mean, some of the functions which can be translated into X queries, and that's how you see people interacting with your data as they pass the I, 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 I mean, in, in my sort of ideal world, I think SQL doesn't exist. It's, you know, I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, it, 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 there's, there's a tremendous, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of problems that, that a big SQL database is absolutely the right problem for, and it will continue to be the right solution for it. What um, company do you work for? They sign my paychecks, I'm not going to say anything different, but, <laughs> no, they're, they're, absolutely, there's a, no, I'm, I'm, I'm verifying their business model, there's absolutely a, a significant set of problems that they are the right solution for, however, there's a significant set of problems that they're not the right solution for. And I think the fact that they're already working on a NoSQL product of their own tells you that that's the case. And once you've stepped away from that model, I think trying to shoehorn SQL back into it is, is just going backwards. So actually, my question was not about just SQL. Mm -hmm. It was about how users want to interact with their data, right? So SQL, the reason I brought SQL is because people understand SQL. Fair. They understand the, the representation, right? So, I was just thinking, what would be the way users are going to interact in a easily understandable, interpreted manner to their data, right? I mean, do we have to teach them X query? Yes. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and word, yes, but it's uh, A, X query, and especially JSONic without XML stuff on it, it's not that complicated. It's actually not that much harder than, than the SQL at the, at the base level at any rate. It's just that you've got a lot more levels you can grow into. And B, uh, my boss would like to say something about uh, the, it. Can I answer your question? Uh, my own, there are the, a lot of good reasons why you would still like the SQL as an interface. The major reason being there's so many reporting tools written out there, which interact with data in SQL. Remember that before you write all those reporting tools, which was in Xperia, which was going to take a long time, the only way to interact and make those reporting tools work is to interact with SQL. Uh, we had a PhD student in Zurich, in ADH, who, who worked with us, and he took, wrote the translator from SQL to Xperia. So you write for SQL, automatically Xperia is generated, so you're running to Xperia. I actually want to so talk like about that. Okay, <laughs> I'll give you a link. Just an FYI, I'll be able to talk Okay. I can translate both Sparkle, translate both Sparkle and SQL into Xperia. So you can use an Xperia runtime, or basically you have a single runtime for all three languages. Very nice. So let's get that out there. Anything to ease the introduction? I, mean, I think, hopefully, ideally, that's a short-term solution, where short-term in Oracle times is, is fairly long. But but um, it would be still, I think, a useful thing to have. Sure. Anything that uses adoption is good for us.
Yeah. I like what you're doing a lot. I think the, the whole, I think the one thing that's missing is a mapping mechanism, <coughs> whether it's a schema-based thing or annotation that says how do we get data types in XML into um, serialized into JSON the way we want them to mm -hmm. process because the consumer of JSON may not want the standard X query style of date format. Right. right. Versa, you know, they may be producing data in JSON that X query doesn't like. And so we need to map <coughs> these data types over to, because it's, I don't think it's realistic to think that different database vendors are going to embrace the X query data style or mm -hmm. other data type formats. We need some way to, for them to get into their native format and some standard vectors, whether it's fun standard functions that we call mm -hmm. um, or annotations or a, a external schema or external configuration that maps those. I think that's a critical part to this language. William, does this version of Trizorba have the JSON extensions enabled on it, do you know? So, so I might Mongo, be. Mongo, so Mongo be as, ex, ex, as uh, more than just some type tracks that they type IDs and stuff like that. So I was just going to wonder if this works. Type to JSON and from to JSON, this works. So it does work. So this is the way we do it right now. Um, I created an, I've created an array that has a single item in it, which is the current date as an excess date time, a schema date time. And what happened in serialization time, and not before, is that we created a JSON object that says, hi, I've got a value which is outside the bounds of JSON. And its type is an excess date time, and its value is this. And so that's all falling back to the, the schema way of handling things. And so that is round trip, right? I mean, that's enough information that I could parse that back in and have the same thing. You can put it in, theoretically, you can put it in type you want there. So you could say type is Mongo date, if we needed to, that kind of thing. Um, or I guess my suggestion would be that everything gets filtered into the X square by looking at things on the way in. And then, off, as in when it needs to go back to something different, it gets filtered back. So. So Zorba is Flower Foundation? Mm -hmm. Oracle. That's well, Flower Foundation, which is, is, as I said, heavily sponsored by Oracle and Twain, so. All right. I, oh, you have one more back there? No? Okay, and I'm actually over time, so thank you very much.